could find such a love at our age. Whoever thought we could dance on a thrilling... Welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I'm your co-host, Judy Alexander, and I'm here with my husband, Dr. Bruce Chalmer. Hello, Judy. Hello, viewers and listeners. And Judy, tell folks the title. Reclaiming the Masculine and Feminine Within, an interview with Danae Logan. We just finished that interview. And, mm -hmm. you know, I keep saying this because it keeps being true. It is. It was delightful. It we was delightful. We keep having all these great guests. We have guests. great guests. We do. We do. Danae was really interesting. And she's, she's <laughs> as I said during the thing, you're getting all Jungian, you know. <laughs> she's really fascinating how she incorporates a lot of depth psychology stuff, which is sort of the Jungian stuff, into her couples therapy work. Mm -hmm. And uh, how she, she talks a lot about how that notion of the inner masculine inner feminine that we all have plays out in couples relationships mm -hmm. so do stay tuned for that um, and let's put in some plugs for our stuff okay so we have uh, your latest book it's not about communication why everything you know about couples therapy is wrong yep I do mention that and um, late in our uh, conversation by the way I mentioned how that that fits in it's funny it's a the themes that Danae was talking about fit in very nicely with a lot of the stuff that I like to write about. They so we certainly had, do. We had fun you with that. You guys have a lot of uh, lot, lot in common. Yes, we do. And, and then there was the first book that started the podcast, which we also talked about. We did. Actually, I think we talked about that afterwards. Well, we talked about yeah, that okay. afterwards. But, yes. but nevertheless, those <laughs> of you who are familiar listeners and watchers, Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back. Yes, indeed. Um, do get those uh, anywhere you can get books. And uh, from the Amazon site, you can get the audio book that I did the for each of those that I did the uh, narration of. And I'm, I've been telling folks why you should buy those books. Because, you know, not mm -hmm. just telling you that I wrote them because I think they're good. But the stuff I've been hearing about reigniting the spark is it makes you feel better. You know, if you're having struggles in your relationship, it's not like that reading that book will solve all your problems. You know, that's not how it works. No, but, uh, but it will help you get a sense of how you can proceed. And that uh, people often find, wow, it just feels good to have read this. And you've heard from people who said their relationship was fine, but after reading that book, it gave them a little extra zzzz. Exactly, yes. Whatever that extra <laughs> zzzz. I don't know how you spell that, but that's what it gave them, yes. So there's that. And then the other book, the, the first one that you mentioned, the mm -hmm. more recent book, uh, It's Not About Communication. That's about understanding this whole business of therapy and how to make use of it and um, and why some of probably what some of you may be doing is, mm, I hate to say it, but probably useless. Anyway, <laughs> you can read about it in that book and what could be useful to you then. So, right, I'm not, I'll just leave you hanging there. So that's why to get those. And we should talk about our you, sponsor. Your, well, <laughs> our sponsor. Our sponsor, my book, yes. <laughs> The Blue Tent, Erotic Tales from the Bible by Laria Zilber, Laria my pseudonym. Zilber. Judy's pseudonym. Yes. And uh, that is, if you're into erotica, mm -hmm. uh, if you even think you might be into erotica, mm -hmm. it's really well-written erotica. It is, and it has... It how can I put this? It has the desired effect, <laughs> depending on what effect you yes, desire. If you want to give your relationship that extra zoom. <laughs> yeah, uh, by yourself or with a partner. That's right. Uh, it is really delightful. And mm -hmm. it's also, as I've so often pointed out, it is firmly rooted in a very deep, uh, loving understanding of Torah, of, of, of the, the Bible. Bible. Right. And, you know, from a Jewish perspective, but mm -hmm. it is not only from a Jewish perspective. Of course, those of you who are Christians, it's it's... Part of your Bible, too. That's right. Uh, so you will enjoy that. So you can get that also anywhere where books are sold. I want to put in also um, a mention of the book, and I mentioned this also as we were in mm -hmm. our um, interview. The book that I've been working on, I'm getting closer and closer to having a draft done. Uh, I'm hoping another, you know, two, three weeks I'll have a draft done. Uh, it, the working title is Betrayal, Forgiveness, and Faith. And so if you have stories of betrayal, I'm still interested in hearing them. Uh, I've actually incorporated a couple that readers got in touch with yes, me when I've, yes. when I've said this. Uh, they're in the book, disguised thoroughly, but nevertheless, uh -huh. the, the ideas are very helpful. Um, that, I think, is a... Um, there's going to be a lot of people interested in that book. There's a lot of people who have said, you know, when they go through a betrayal, it's... It, it, we don't call it a betrayal if it isn't really painful, you mm -hmm. know. It's, it's part of what a betrayal is, something really painful happening to you. And they reach out for something that will help them get through the crisis. And that's what this book is about. Yeah. 
Uh, so I hope you will be interested in that. And of course, we'll keep you posted on that. And one final thing before we get to our interview, which is please sign up for my newsletter, uh, Dr. Chalmers newsletter. You can do that by going to our um, website for our uh, podcast, ctn7.com. Those of you, I, I have been neglecting to mention this. Those of you who are viewing this as opposed to merely listening to it, get to see the QR code up ah. there. Uh, I think I think I'm pointing in the right <laughs> spot up above my head. Um, that uh, if you scan that QR code, that'll take you right to ctn7.com. That's number seven. And you will be able to drop us a line. You'll be able to sign up for my newsletter, all that good stuff. All the good stuff. So let's get on with our interview. Okay. And we'll see you on the other side. Our guest today is Danae Logan. Danae is a marriage and family therapist, a group facilitator, a speaker, and an author based in Los Angeles. In addition to working with clients in private practice, she is a mindfulness coach, a yoga teacher, a tenacious wisdom seeker, and a California soul through and through. In her work as a therapist, Danae specializes in helping couples find deeper fulfillment in their relationships, utilizing her background in depth psychology to explore how each of us can reclaim the aspects of ourselves we've been conditioned to turn away from. She facilitates group immersive experiences and retreats and is also co-host of the podcast, Cheaper Than Therapy. <laughs> Danae's forthcoming book is Sovereign Love, A Guide to Healing Relationships by Reclaiming the Masculine and Feminine Within. Danae, welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. Thank you so much, Judy and Bruce. It's so nice to meet you both and thanks for having me. Oh, we're delighted. Nice to have you on the show. So we always like to start with our guests by asking, how did you get into the work you do? Tell us something about your own journey. Mm, well, um, you know, as you say that, I, I'm thinking, well, how did I become a couples therapist? I certainly have always been a seeker and I've always been curious about what makes us tick as human animals, why we behave the way that we do. Um, and I've been a spiritual seeker for most of my life. So when it was kind of a strange thing for me to be really into Oprah's soul series and like tuning into all of these um, spiritual teachers and their teachings, I was always like really fascinated with attempting to understand um, not only what we're doing in these bodies, but what happens when we leave these bodies, right? I was just always really curious about that. And I think in at different periods in my life, I used to have some anxiety around that, right? So I was really hungry to heal that anxiety within myself and find a little bit of peace around um, some of that existential anxiety. But then also, like, I just loved my own therapy sessions. So when I would mm -hmm. go to therapy, I think a lot of people don't love therapy. I'm like, uh -huh. therapy has always felt like a massage to me. <laughs> like, I love it. I'm oh, like, wow. I no. get no just the mind, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally. I just get to talk about, you know, what's coming up for me. And I, I loved it. Um, and so eventually I decided to go back to grad school to become a therapist. And I don't know if the two of you experienced this, um, but couples or therapists in general, I find either really like with working with couples or they won't work with couples. Right? I, I was going to ask you, I read your book, by the way, which I really enjoyed. You and, did. And, oh, Aww. yes. Be recommending it to folks. But what that was one yeah. of the things I had listed as one of the questions to ask you is that very comment, because I totally get that myself. I'm uh, between the two of us. I'm the therapist. I'm Judy's, not. Yeah. Okay. Judy's, not, Judy's an educator. But Beautiful. that was, um, yeah, I, I love it. And I have so many colleagues who won't touch it with a 10 foot pole. It's <laughs> yeah. so true, right? Yeah. And it can be hard to find referrals for couples therapists because I find a lot of therapists really don't like working with couples that much. Mm -hmm. um, but for whatever reason, I loved it. When I started my practicum after grad school, I was like, this is fascinating. And they just started giving me all the couples <laughs> in the private <laughs> practice that I joined um, because I enjoyed it so much. And so I found that um, there was something about attempting to understand how we love that just really fascinated me so much. And um, what I talk about in the book that you were just referring to, Bruce, is that as someone who was working as a couples therapist, I'd been married for almost 12 years. And I realized that my relationship was going to change form and that we needed to transition from a marriage into a friendship. And it was like this fascinating, like, oh, so I'm the couples therapist whose marriage is ending. This is, uh, this is the fascinating place for me to find myself I, I was in. too once, by the way, just saying. Oh, you were? <laughs> I, I was in a, in a similar, well, yeah, in, a, in that position as well. 
Yeah. So you understand (laughs) how that leaves you with like, well, (laughs) but it also gives you, you know, a, a different perspective on a lot of how we've held relationships. And I certainly became almost determined to understand what makes fulfillment and partnerships so challenging for so many of us. And what I found was that there's just a way that, you know, um, the patriarchal programming that all of us have lived with um, is impacting our relationships in ways that I didn't really find a lot of the couples therapy orientations were talking about or exploring. And I kind of became obsessed with Bell Hooks's work. And Mm -hmm. she talks a lot about how, there's just a way that all of us are impacted regardless of gender by patriarchal programming. And I started to see that like all of the couples I was working with, this was impacting how they were relating to one another in ways that had never really been explored from my perspective in, you know, the clinical work that I'd had sort of drawn from, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I noted also, you got all, you get all Jungian, right? <laughs> that's <laughs> that's another Jungian. part of and the depth psycholo- psychology stuff and the, yeah. the anima and animus stuff. I don't know that that's a very, that isn't even a question, but please talk about that if you would, like, how do you yes. incorporate all of that? Well, you can tell you're a therapist. You're like, you get all I am to the anima and animus. And a lot of times I'm going, going... <laughs> she's yeah, like, what are that. you two that's talking okay. no, This is why I, I do this. I love to learn all about this stuff. Yeah. Well, and Judy's role in, in our podcast is to be the actual person. <laughs> <laughs> who, who actually speaks the language that most people speak, which is really, I mean, she's, of course, well, very intelligent I'll as well. I'll in and, and ask questions <laughs> yeah. when they need clarification for us lay people out there. Yeah. yeah, I love that because I think there's a way that we can sort of, you know, I have a podcast with one of my best girlfriends who I went to grad school with, and we sort of geek out on all of this mm-hmm. like, uh-huh. therapy speak, but then sometimes we'll be with like our partners or people in in the world and they'll be like y'all are really just sort of going off and like you need tangents and we're like, oh sorry really back um but to the point that you were making Bruce um when I went to grad school I studied depth psychology which um a lot of times people think I'm saying death psychology I'm saying depth <laughs> like deep waters mm-hmm. and um depth psychology is really the psychology of the soul and so it's you know what are sort of the elements of the collective unconscious that are playing out in our our collective experience and, you know, like things like what happened in 2020, the last few years that we've been experiencing, I think from a depth psychology perspective, I sort of say, oof, like what's happening in terms of our collective shadow that this is attempting to get us to tune into, or um, what are the elements of what we're not understanding about humanity and the way Mm -hmm. humanity reacts to certain things that I sort of like zoom out a little bit on like the hero's journey of our lives to examine whatever it is. And so when I started working with couples, I really brought a Jungian perspective to the work. And as Bruce was just noting, a large part of what Carl Jung was the first person to talk about was that all of us have both masculine and feminine energetics within us. And he called them the anima and the animus. And the anima is sort of the like you know, the way Jung described them, the feminine elements within someone who identifies as a man and the animus are the masculine elements um, of someone who identifies as a woman. Now, since Jung's time, we've come to understand it's a lot more complex and nuanced than just those binaries. But what is and holds true is that all of us have both masculine and feminine energy within us. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, from my perspective, there's a lot about our world that has really operated in a wounded masculine template for Mm. centuries now, right? Like we've sort of been like productivity at all costs, like competition, like, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, that sort of like hyper independent. I've got this way of like, you know, even the nuclear family structure is a real departure from the feminine way of holding things, which is really collaborative and that like we are collective and we need one another. Um, And, you know, there's so much history when you go back and look at the history of patriarchy that is like why that is and why that was sort of like the system of dominance that has been at play for so long. But um, what I could see in couples as I was sitting with them after a while was there's a way that we have really been conditioned to outsource those elements of ourselves. So if I identify as a woman, I'm looking to identify or excuse me, to outsource my masculine energy. Mm -hmm. If I'm in a heteronormative dynamic to the man in my life, right? So I'm not fully integrating in my own inner masculine. And I'm sort of knowing on a soul level, I believe that that's not like the fullest expression of what I'm meant to do um, with my life. You know, Jung would 
talk about that in the context of the individuation process and that there are certain things we're meant to experience to become who we're meant to become in this lifetime. And I think our soul sort of resists the things that stand in the way of that. And so what I started to do was play with how these dynamics, these masculine and feminine energetics were playing out with couples. And I found that there was a way to sort of support them in integrating these dynamics mm. within themselves. And it just started to lead to a lot more harmony in our relationships, you know? Yeah. We, we going to say, say something. Yeah. So I, what I'm noting, you know, as coming from a, a heterosexual male that I am, yeah. I was fascinated by your sort of two by two table. Mm. Of, which is to say there's wounded and healthy mm -hmm. and then there's masculine and feminine yeah and you mentioned as you were saying that that so much of patriarchy is about the wounded masculine Absolutely. because what i'll note and again i'm sure this is conditioned by the fact that i'm a man what i'll note a lot i'll hear a lot from women that they're missing the healthy male aspects of the men mm. in their lives that's right to say you know not to mention the healthy male masculine and feminine aspects of their own lives but that that part gets you know one of the things that happens when uh when it's described as patriarchy is that and i noted you had a chapter on this which i really appreciated mm. sort of saying you know it's not just that men are messed up and women aren't no. <laughs> or that men mess up women it's that no. no we're all kind of messed up here and that element of uh regaining the healthy masculinity as well as the healthy femininity in all of us is an important part of it i mean again that's that's what i resonated to yeah. Thank you for saying that, Bruce, because I think that's a really important point that a lot of times when you say the word patriarchy, um, especially my brothers will sort of like recoil a little bit like she's coming for the men and <laughs> patriarchy is not men. Yeah. And I cannot say that strongly enough. Um, and men are deeply impacted by patriarchy in ways that I find to be really harmful to men. Um, and as you were saying in um, the way you were describing that chart that's in my book, most of us as women, especially um, with the modern feminist movement, as grateful as we all are as women for the feminist movement, please hear me as I say that, most of us as women were really, um, you know, encouraged through feminism to actually disconnect even further from the feminine elements of ourselves. So it becomes, I can do everything a man can do in the workplace. I can work an eight hour day and then come home and start, you know, tending to the kids and all of the things that need to be done. And I can be hyper productive and constantly disconnected from how I'm really feeling in my body, all of these wounded elements of masculinity. And um, I find that not only do we not have a whole lot of models of like what healthy masculinity actually looks like, um, you know, I have a little bit of a like visceral reaction to the phrase toxic masculinity because mm. I don't think that masculinity is toxic. I think masculinity is beautiful, but I think what we have been experiencing as masculinity is really wounded masculinity mm. and it's a very different thing. Um, I like that word wounded as opposed to mm, toxic. Absolutely. Because wounds can heal. But how do you reconstruct a, a system that needs to be deconstructed? <laughs> That's a really important question, Judy, right? Um, and I think from my perspective, it's a lot about personal responsibility and that what we have been doing, and I, I still see a lot of this playing out on social media and the conversations that people have about patriarchy is it's sort of like this, you know, what I like to call the unspoken battle of the sexes. And we sort of make men toxic and, you know, that like, I like to say men were raised in the same system that we have been raised in. And most of them have ingested and been breathing the air of these patriarchal templates as much as we have. Um, and so it's like, where does patriarchy show up in me? I love to say this about racism all the time. Like, mm. I don't think it actually is super helpful to point the finger at people and say, like, you are being racist and mm. there is no racism within me. I like to say, OK, if we want to live in a world where there is less racism, how do I start with me and take responsibility for where is there racism or prejudice or bias in me that I have blind spots to? How can I take responsibility for that? Because I feel like what ends up happening is that just allows me to be a lot more compassionate and yeah. present with other people. And it's hard in general to hate up close. I think most of the time why we are at war with one another, if we are in this war of the sexes is because we're not really working to understand how the other feels. And what I see so often in couples is we're just defending against this person experiencing me as bad or this person feeling like I'm falling short versus yeah. like, 
how do I really attempt to understand what this feels like for you? But in order to do that, I really have to be able to stay with myself and sure. like find my center through whatever what you say brings up for me, you know. The the book I'm working on now, actually, the working title is Betrayal, Forgiveness, and Faith. Mm. And in talking about how you move on from betrayal, I mean, I'm I'm way past this part, the sections of the book where I talk about what forgiveness is, and I'm just using it in terms of letting go of the anger part. But then mm. you have to figure out, okay, can I trust this person? And what I've noted with so many of the couples I've worked with is when they're able to reach this sort of what I call it is the oh shit moment. It's like, oh shit, no wonder. Oh my God, I see what you're saying, even though I it's in conflict with what I'm saying, but I can understand it now. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a a moment of it's disturbing, but it's also very productive. It's like a, a transformative moment. Well, when people get to that moment, the only way they get there is from feeling valid, not invalid. You know, mm -hmm. it's when you're talking about racism, it's like, yeah, to say, oh, you're being racist or I'm being racist, or be, even that whole concept, it, you know, there's a validity to how we're all responding all the time, even when it's pretty awful. And you know what, the other thing that occurred to me as you were saying this, we happen to have interviewed our previous podcast person who's going to be, well, it doesn't matter when it's going to be in terms of when people are seeing this, but the one right before this one mm -hmm. um, was a, a, a woman in um, Australia who mm -hmm. was talking about sexual fantasies. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about sexual fantasies as taboo often. Mm -hmm. They're the, you know, people having fantasies about being treated in ways they would never actually want to be treated, you know, in fact, you know, women having rape fantasies, for example, yeah. that sort of thing. And it's fascinating because the what she does with that is starts by validating it, not start by approving of it or disapproving of it, but starts by validating. It's like, well, this is there's something important in this. Mm. I like to think that's true in terms of racism and prejudice and sexism and all of those things. There are elements of uh, how we've evolved that contribute to those things. Mm. And if we don't freak out, then we can work with it and not be so horrible to each other. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. I love what you're saying, because I think that there's something in the curiosity around the thing versus just immediately going to the black and white thinking that this is like immoral mm -hmm. or moral yeah, or right, right yeah. or wrong, um, where we sort of shut ourselves off from the understanding of what is attempting to come to the surface in whatever the thing is, right? So if there's specific fantasies that are coming to the surface for me, can I be curious about what's that about? Like what aspect mm -hmm. of self am I attempting to tune into or not giving myself access to that that fantasy is an indication of that maybe I've relegated to the basement of my psyche and I'm not allowing mm -hmm. any space in a Union way that could shadow, be healing. Right? That's the shadow, that's the yeah. shadow. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Sorry yeah. about that. That's okay. okay. <laughs> We're geeking out here. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I just want to go back to your book because mm -hmm. you organize it around three stages. If I'm not mistaken, there's structure, seeking and sovereign. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Thanks, explain Steve. that to our listeners. Yeah. So, you know, to me, the, the, when this does come back to Jungian psychology a little bit, and that Jung talked about the individuation process and that, you know, in the first half of our lives, we're sort of oriented towards the external world. So, um, you know, when we're children, we need our caregivers for safety. We need our peers to give us a sense of like, this is who I am in relation to the other. And there's sort of a framework. There's a structure of what our lives are going to look like, right? Like we live with our parents and then we go to school. And then from there we go to college and then eventually we get a job, maybe we get married and then um, we retire. And this is like sort of the blueprint for what our lives are going to look like. And it's really sort of like laid out in a linear fashion of like, this is what is true. Now, what Jung described was that there's a point normally around midlife where we start to differentiate from what we've been offered in terms of like, this is like the inevitable truth of what your life should be. And we start to question a little bit and it's like, hmm, what else could be true? And does that mm -hmm. feel true to me? And like some of the things that my parents do really don't or did really don't resonate in terms of like how I want to live my life or raise my children. And so we start to just be in this space of inquiry and questioning. And then eventually like that is what is described as the individuation process. And then we go sort of on like this inner quest to like discover ourselves a little bit more, understand ourselves a little bit more and ultimately become the person that we're meant to become. Um, in the book, I sort of talk about those three phases 
of the individuation process in terms of like masculine and feminine mm. energy. So in the yeah. beginning that like oriented towards the outside world is like the wounded masculine energy. And so the masculine is oriented towards like the external. Um, when we come to that midlife phase and we start to be in the questioning, the inquiry, that's sort of, we go inward, which is the feminine. Right. And so we go into the like dark, mysterious space of um, our soul space. And sometimes that looks like um, a dark night of the soul or something that like really disrupts us in a way where we start questioning everything in a way, because we have no choice. And then eventually that third stage of stage of life um, becomes what I would call the sovereign stage. So it's like structure seeking and then sovereign. And that's hopefully where we start to integrate those masculine and feminine energetics within ourselves. And then we're sort of in that space of like, yes, I know how to go inward and get still and come to like the truths that feel really resonant for me. But then I move into the space of inspired action and I go out into the world and I can be of service in a way that mm -hmm. is like the unique blueprint for how I'm meant to serve and, you know, show up for the collective because I have a sense of myself. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that and it, that is so interesting that that um, integration of masculine and feminine that results in that sense of oh, I'm I'm existing, I'm I'm intimate with the world. I guess that's what the the way it suddenly occurs to me to say it. You know, mm -hmm. it's sort of being able to be fully alive and present and feel that your presence in the world uh, fits. It's like oh yeah, this is what I'm here to do. I love that, that you said. Yeah, I I hadn't thought of it in those terms until you were just saying that. But that sense of um, of being fully alive, it involves that integration of both the masculine and the feminine energy. Does that, does that, yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. I love that. And I hadn't heard someone say intimate with the world in the uh, way that you just yeah. did. And I just was really struck by that because to me, that's being in an interdependent relationship with the world where mm -hmm. I can stay within myself and be in relationship with the world without losing a self. And yeah. I was just facilitating a group before I got on with the two of you. And we were talking about how we're sort of a society that has lost our connection to the value of spiritual solitude and mm. that most of us don't really have, you know, a relationship with ourselves in that way. Certainly it's gotten a little bit like we can't be alone with ourselves. Even if we're alone, we like have a device in our hands all the time, right. distracting right. us from solitude. Right. Um, but that that comes at a cost because ultimately we really don't have a sense of what I love to call capital S self, which is like the soul self. Um, but in order to be in relationship with the world in a way that we are in integrity with who we want to be versus just sort of like group think and following the pack, I think that that, it, that requires what you just said. It's like, how do we be able to be intimate with the world by being intimate with ourselves first yeah. in a way that we really know who we are? Yeah. And that, you know, in terms of the way, as I was reading your book, I was thinking, I'm mapping my favorite terminology, you know, this is what I tend to do when I read stuff like, oh, I like this because sounds like something that like sounds it. like something I thought of, you know, except that it's, of course, giving new, it's giving new, uh, a new spin on it, you know, but that notion, I, one of my favorite dichotomies is the, what every relationship needs, I think every living thing needs is a combination of both stability and intimacy. You could That's say, you know, and I didn't, I, I use those terms, but lots of people have had, you know, similar kinds of concepts and that masculine is more like the stability and feminine is more like the intimacy. That's, That's what right. it's about. And you need them both. And I, as I often point out, the chief skill of stability is to avoid anxiety mm. or lower it. The chief skill of intimacy is to tolerate it, That's to tolerate right. anxiety. And it's to find that balance and not freak out is kind of, <laughs> there's there's the, the trick of living, I suppose. It's certainly the trick of being in a couple. I wish. It's, yeah. Judy, your husband gets it. You're like, <laughs> he does. He's a woman. <laughs> well, the, the neat thing is she does too, and doesn't have mm. to describe it in 37 syllables, you know, which is kind of nice. <laughs> it works well for it works well. <laughs> I mean, I love it. You guys are goals. That's beautiful. And I think you're right, Bruce. There's all of these different ways that, all of these different couples therapy modalities or ways that we've talked about the human experience attempt to sort of describe what you're saying. I think like sometimes people describe it as like attachment versus authenticity mm -hmm. or um, stability versus adventure. But ultimately to me, I sort of see things through that masculine and feminine lens. But what I have found is we've put such an emphasis on the structure and the stability and like, yeah. here's how you communicate to keep the structure intact versus mm -hmm. like, yeah, but we also need Eros. We also need aliveness and sensuality and all of these mm -hmm. beautiful elements of life force that I think 
or the feminine that we haven't yeah. put a lot of emphasis on, you know. But my, my last book was titled It's Not About Communication, Why Everything <laughs> You Know About Couples Therapy is Wrong. And it's I heard a rather that. arrogant title. <laughs> I love it. It's not about communication. <laughs> so it's exactly that. And it's funny, I hadn't thought until now, I had until you're saying this, I hadn't thought in terms of, yeah, the whole focus. Because what I my basic thesis is all of this stuff where people train people in active listening and yeah, they're not bad ideas, but when they become the focus, when they become the ideology as opposed to the yeah. idea, it just gets dead that's and right. it it's not what it's about. And I never thought before in terms of, yeah, that's all the masculine structure stuff. It's not the feminine intimacy stuff. Ugh. And, yeah. I, uh, he so gets it. And, yeah. you know, I think a lot of times people say couples therapy doesn't work and it's because it kind of doesn't to your point. Like mm -hmm. it works for like a week or two when we're really like, let's, you know, keep playing out the like roles and like doing whatever the dialogue was that our couples therapist instructed us to, mm -hmm. to do. And then the aliveness, the emotion, the like, you did this thing and I don't care about the script, rah, like comes up <laughs> and all yeah. of that's out the window and it's irrelevant. But if we can be curious about like, okay, I am deeply activated by you. I wonder why. Can I pause mm -hmm. and like get into the space of curiosity versus like, you know, yeah, we're going to be activated. This is what it is to be alive and hopefully make that a good thing about our relationship. There's life force here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I liken therapy to improv, basically. Mm. And, and when I used to, I, I just this year, I'm, I'm old enough now that I finally decided I'm not going to take insurance anymore. You know, I mean, I have the license that has let me take insurance. I've done it for 30 years. Mm. I finally last year said, oh, to heck with it. I'm done. And one of the nice things about that is I don't have to worry about treatment plans. Yes. And, and I, I point out in the book, it's like, well, the thing about a treatment plan for couples therapy is it's not treatment and it's not planned. Other than that, it's fine, you know? <laughs> so but true. it's not planned. It's improv. It's, it's about getting, you know, everybody saying yes. And as opposed to no, damn it. Oh and my gosh. Yes. That's, you know, yeah. yeah. Cause that's not how life works. That's not how life works. And it, it's not how it doesn't, it doesn't also, it's not how therapy works. works. Right. It doesn't really help anybody. I had never thought about treatment plans that way. Bruce, but you're absolutely <laughs> right. There's still such a linear way of holding what this work is when even the relationship between a therapist and a client is so alive and, you know, circular and sort of like oh, yeah. what is life for us today, you know? Oh, and, and think about, you know, is it a success or not? When you're in couples therapy, there are three people involved in it. And they probably have three different opinions of whether it's a success or not. And I recognize when I'm <laughs> the therapist, my opinion is the least important of those three, but it counts too. And, yeah. you know, so people will say, well, what's your success rate? I don't keep track of a success rate. I noted this, you you pointed this out as well. I, actually, I listened to one of your podcast episodes too uh -huh. with, with uh, Vanessa. I really enjoyed that. And yeah. I think you pointed this out in there too, or words to this effect. It's not about saving the relationship. It's about people being better. Yes. And sometimes being better is about breaking up. And I, I tell people, I have a bias. I don't, I don't shy away from a bias toward mm -hmm. wanting to help people stay together if they want to, because I feel better that way, you know, and I'm an, I'm an old <laughs> stuff, you know, yeah. but it's a bias, but sometimes, you know, is it a success or not? If they break up, well, one person might be feeling like, oh, good. That's just what we needed to clarify things. We need to break mm -hmm. up. And the other person may be devastated by that and feel like, no, I want, I was trying to save it. I don't know how to evaluate that other than to say, well, that's life. I mean, that's, you know, that's a good thing. <laughs> we got to where we needed to get to, apparently, even though that was unhappy for at least one of the one of the people. It's yeah. just not, you know, the stuff that they talk about. When when I had my gallbladder out, my usual go-to, isn't that a great thing to talk about? <laughs> oh. I won't show you the scar. <laughs> it, it's very small. It was laparoscopic. This is a long time ago. This is 20 some years ago, 23, 24 years ago. Before, <laughs> yes, before we're we've been together 20 years. And when um when I had my gallbladder out, I was really glad I had a very linear, I suppose in your terms, masculine oriented surgeon. Mm, I think it well, would yes. actually be a man. But the point was, even if it was a woman, you know, that linearly logical, uh, yeah. not constructivist, but but logical positivist. You know, it's like I know what the thing is, I know where to go to get it out. And when I take it out, you'll feel better. And damn it, it worked. And I was very glad about that. But couples therapy isn't gallbladder surgery. Yeah. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. And I think what you're saying is really, I mean, I love so much of what you just said, Bruce, but I think there's something really important in what you're saying in that, like, we do need structure. We yeah. do need certain things that keep us tethered to something that like provides consistency. Without that, we're just sort of like flailing through life with a lot 
of, you know, anxiety and, you know, just feeling like we're not rooted into anything that gives us a sense of mission and purpose and all of those beautiful elements of the healthy masculine. Um, but the other thing you said that I think is really important is I think that multiple things can be true at one time. Like, you're while, here. right. <laughs> like I often say when I sit with couples, the relationship is my client and I, I want what's best for the relationship. And sometimes that means for it to dissolve. And I often say that I think people a lot of times end things too quickly in our society. Mm -hmm. And they sort of are like too quick to throw in the towel and too quick to just say like, well, this isn't working. So let's just scrap it. And so mm -hmm. both of those truths can yes. exist in the room, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that especially, I think people will sometimes break up in, in great pain. I don't see people breaking up lightly, at least what are mm. they seeing a therapist for, if that's the case, but they'll sometimes break up in great pain before they've learned what they needed to learn, yes. which often seems sad to me, you know, which the, they, and then they carry on to a, another relationship yes, because exactly. they haven't resolved it yeah. or dealt with that's it. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that you're right, Judy, I think whatever the elements of our shadow are that we haven't integrated, I do think that they will rear their head again in the next relationship. If yeah. we don't sort of step away from the dynamic and say, what was this dynamic showing me about me? Because so often it's like, oh, I was in relationship with a narcissist, this horrible person. And it's like, well, if I don't understand why I was attracted to that mm -hmm. energy and that dynamic and that person, I will inevitably find that in the next person I end up in a relationship with. That is so yeah. true. Oh, mm. yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. What, what else should we be asking you about? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I, I just oh, wanted to ask yeah. you about, um, you know, femininity, you know, mm. this, you talked about being how women are raised in, in a world where, you know, you want to find your knight in shining armor and somebody to come along and save you. But how do you, how do you go with that scenario versus being independent, but yet wanting to be in a relationship, wanting the man to be masculine, but not too masculine. And <laughs> it's tough to be a woman, right, Judy? It's like we're it's attempting hard to, to be a man, too. It's like, you Absolutely. know, when you have all of these changing roles in, in life, you know, how yeah. do you how do you now define masculinity and how do you now define femininity? I was thinking when you said that, that you know, when you said it's hard to be a woman, I was thinking of the America Ferrera thing in the Barbie movie. Right. Did you see right. Barbie? You know, that's I did. That was all yeah, that great that. speech. Yeah. 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 And I think that what you're saying, Judy, really illustrates that. And you're right. It's hard to be a human. And I think mostly because there's all of these external voices telling us who we need to be in order to be doing it right or to be worthy. And I think a lot of the healing of the feminine is can't get it wrong. Right. This is what we came for. I believe this is a life school that we came to learn about ourselves and have all of these things that sort of turn up the pressure and ask us to be in the inquiry about ourselves. But um, in terms of what you were saying about like, what does femininity look like and what does reclaiming the feminine look like in a societal structure where so much of what we've been taught about what it is to be a good woman and a good partner, um, is really, it's confusing and it's, it's challenging to know what that could conceivably look like in terms of like healthy integration. But most of the time, what I find is that the messaging we got as women was like, well, you just need to do it, whatever it is perfectly, right? You need mm -hmm. to have perfect children. You need to have a perfect husband. You need to look perfect. You need to like, you know, whatever the highlight reel that everyone's seeing is, it needs to look really good, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's shifting constantly based on whatever environment I'm in. But so much of, I think, what we were conditioned to believe is like, we should want a man. If we're speaking heteronormatively, we should want a man. We should want a man who, you know, is able to do all of these things to take care of us and provide and all of these things that men have all of this pressure put on them to be, but we should not trust them to do it. Right. Mm. And <laughs> Boy, did that say it from, right? from, from a man's point of view, that is just amazing. Yeah. I yeah. see that all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. I, mean, I, see it, I see it with men, you know, what I actually, I see it with women complaining about men well, understandably it's like he doesn't seem to know what to do and i'm thinking yeah we don't know what to do when feminism came along and you know i'm i'm well i'm a few years older than you but it, I, you would same remember this too. we're in the same generation and that you know when 70s second wave feminism came along mm -hmm. and so many of us as men were thinking well yeah we don't want to be jerks the way mm -hmm. we really have been <laughs> <You know? laughs> and 
And yet how to not be a jerk, but still be masculine turns out to be a real challenge for a lot of men. And I noticed this with a lot of young men, they don't know how to approach a woman. They don't know how to take the lead when the woman seems to want him to take the lead. And that's what I hear from women is he won't be the guy. I, yeah. I do want him to be the guy. Yes, I'm a strong woman. Yes, I need to be respected, but I want him to be the guy sometimes, like especially in sex. And the guys don't know how to do it. That's right. Yeah. And I think what you're saying is really important. And this is a place where I sort of get after my sisters a little bit, <laughs> Bruce, and say, we cannot ask a man to lead if we're not willing to trust in his leadership. And mm -hmm. ultimately it becomes, if I don't trust him, why am I with him? And mm -hmm. that's like a real question that we have to ask of ourselves. Um, and, you know, I think there are generational pain points that have led to why we feel that way. It's understandable. But at some point it's about like, do I trust in life? Do I trust that whatever happens, things will be okay. I can't tell you how often, just as you're describing, Bruce, I will sit with a couple where the woman is like deeply dissatisfied with the amount of emotional labor she's carrying in the household. And, you know, all of the things are my responsibility to figure out and I can't get him to pick up half the load. But then when he attempts to do some of the things mm -hmm. you're asking, you're sort of standing behind him, micromanaging and telling him why he's doing it wrong. <laughs> right. Yeah. And he's like, Oh, what do you want? Like I give up, like, I'm not even going to try because no matter what, I'm going to be doing it wrong anyway. Yeah. And I think, you know, in the conversation we were having before, <laughs> so it's like my first marriage, everything I did, he was over my shoulder. Telling me I was doing it wrong. So yeah, well, you and you know, it's funny because <laughs> I talk about that in terms of under function or over function or dynamics. And, you know, I don't actually think those are as gendered as people suggest that they are. Yeah. I was probably more of the under functioner in my marital dynamic before where my husband was like the more like structure linear, like this is the way we do things. And I was like, oh, we'll figure it out. We'll get there. And he was like, no, we need to plan for retirement. And I was like, we're not anywhere near it. Calm yourself. Right. But I think that it's, um, yeah, their, their energy. Right. And I think that it's sort of like, how do we be curious about like what, because we will inevitably create polarity, I believe with whoever we're in relationship with. So if I were with someone who was a super under functioner, then I would probably step into that over functioner role a little right. bit more because somebody has to, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. so interesting again, from what I see with guys is the sense that we don't quite know how to step into that mm -hmm. without being disrespectful on the one hand. Yes. And, and yet, yeah, it's sort of hard to know. And, you know, the guys in that scenario you described, because I see that a lot too, mm -hmm. the guy has to realize, well, you know, she is better at it than you. She, she's been mm -hmm. doing it longer. She, you know, she has ways that she likes to see it done. And of course, the woman has to understand if you're really going to let go of some of that emotional labor, you're going to have to tolerate it not being done as well as you like. Yeah. Not because and, he's being a jerk, but because no, you actually are better at it. You know, you've done it for years. You know, And I think that's generous of you to us ladies, <laughs> Bruce, but I would also say that just because he doesn't do it the way that you would do it doesn't mean it's wrong. And I mm -hmm. think that a lot of times we can get very like, you know, understandably, we attempt to manage our own anxiety by making sure it's done the way that I would do it. Mm -hmm. And that's some of my own inner work to sit with. But I think what you're saying about men, I think we're living through a time in history where men are really, I from what I find, attempting to like understand and rise and do what's being asked of them. And I think what we as women have to like really look at and take a lot of responsibility for, and this is often not a popular thing when I say this, but um, is that we sort of have to say like, do we want to be right? And this is an old like couples thing, well, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> do we want to be right? Or do we want to be in relationship with these men? And yeah, if it's like, yeah. I'm constantly in the space of like, and I've been oppressed by patriarchy and sit down and like, <laughs> and I find so often men are like, I don't know what to do. So like, yeah. I, I give up. And I think yeah. it can be really healing in our relationships to say, we're both, you know, we've both been impacted, damaged, wounded by all of the dynamics of our society. Like I, I like to say no fault zone, like let's put fault aside. Cause I don't know that fault is super productive ultimately, yeah, yeah. but how do we move forward in a way that creates a little bit more harmony here? Yeah. It's going that no fault thing. It's going back. I mean, look, we are all capable of fault, you know I mean? Moral principles I think are important, but that sense that we're all coming out of, we're doing the best we can, you know, that's, that's a statement of faith. We're just, we're doing the best we can under the circumstances, including the circumstances of 
what do we understand? What if, what's our background? What's, what have our experiences been? And when you come from, but it's the way you react to it also um, will deter will help your relationship too. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. well when you when you do it from a standpoint that well I'm doing the best I can, but I know you are too. Right. And so when we're in conflict, there's a sense there that rather than fight about it, it's like well, as you said, you can get curious about it. You know, it's one other thing I've noticed with um, with women and men over the years that I've been doing you know, thirty years or so that I've been doing couples therapy, and that phenomenon again it seems sort of generational that says now the old man speaks when i was a boy you know <laughs> when i was a teenager uh -huh. this is going to sound amazingly old-fashioned you know i'll use old-fashioned terminology when i was a teenager if you want to do it like assuming heterosexuality here when you want to if i wanted to oppress a girl you know mm -hmm. if a guy wanted to impress a girl he had to show prospects <laughs> you know he had to show himself capable of mm. having that sort of masculine focus on I expect I will be able to support a family. You know, when you're having babies, I will be able, you won't have to be working outside the home when you're raising a baby because I will be able to support the family. And as second wave feminism came and you have many changes that most of us welcome, you know, wow, isn't it interesting? Women can be doctors, women can be lawyers, women can be therapists. Yeah, well, you know, all these things. Yeah. It's like, oh, women can actually make a living, still maybe not at the same level, but mm -hmm. a lot closer. And so women stopped looking at men as as saying, I better be attracted to somebody who could actually support a family. Mm. And so women started being attracted to these, you know, guys that might be fun, but had no basic, you know, no sense of of uh, focus or, or you know, mission in life. Yes. And then get pissed off later on when they have kids and discover, well, he's kind of useless. <laughs> and I, I, I feel bad for the guy because it's like, well, I've always been useless. What do you expect? <laughs> You got what you <laughs> yeah. This didn't all of a sudden happen. I didn't all of a sudden become useless. What are you? <laughs> so I'm curious to hear from the women in the conversation what you know what your experience of that is or what your thoughts are. Well, yeah. I'm a third generation, so yeah, yeah, I was looking for somebody that would provide, and I mm. did want to work, but I also knew that I wanted to be a mother and take a few years off and raise children, and mm -hmm. I did want a guy that would be the breadwinner and the provider, and um, you know, I. <laughs> the strong, I don't want to say strong one, because I'm a strong person, mm -hmm. but the one that was doing that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I know, you know, next generation, it's probably very different. You're in a, another generation than we're in. So I don't know what your experience was growing up in terms of what you were looking for in a partner. You know, it's interesting. I will say that I think what you are both speaking to is there was a way that we've we've sort of gotten away from like, what is my role in this dynamic? And what, like, what is my purpose in your life? Like if, if mm -hmm. I'm a man and I'm with a woman and she's like, I don't need a man to take care of me. I'll mm -hmm. open my own doors and pay for my own dinner. He's like, okay, amazing. So why am I here? Like genuinely, what, what do you want from me? And I think what's been tough is that has been an answer that we haven't really had, or a question that we haven't really had an answer to as mm -hmm. women. Um, what I will say is that I have found there is a way that women are still really hungry for healthy masculine containment in a way that we aren't even aware that we're hungry for until we experience it. Meaning it feels so unbelievably good to be with a man as a woman who will take the lead and who, who has enough of a sense of self that he will not be dominated by you and will say, I am well aware that you can pay for your dinner and I find it an honor to be out with the goddess mm -hmm. that you are. And I would like to treat you to dinner. Thank you. Sit down. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I think that it's, it's all I, of a sudden like, Ooh, I know, that, I'll, I'll share nice. a story. Uh, the, it's the opening door story. You know, the first mm. time I met Judy uh, and I was already in my early fifties and she was in her forties, you know, mid forties. And uh, so we were, it was, we were getting in the car. Right. Mm -hmm. And Judy just observed very, she's very, really nice about how she does this. And she said, Oh, do you open the door for, you know, <laughs> for your date? And I said, would you like me to? Mm -hmm. Because in my previous marriage, that probably would have been taken as an insult. Yeah, It's like, what do you, you know, why are you, why are you go, you know, treating me down that way? You know, whereas you said you would like it. And I felt happy and you felt happy. It was sort of like and to this day, he opens oh, doors for me. I do. <laughs> and because it feels good, it just yeah. feels good. And it's, and you're accepting it. You're wanting it and accepting it feels good. It's this sense of, oh, good. That, that is that answer to what do you need me for? Well, among other things, I can open the door for you. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. It just feels good. 
I think there are still like there are things that we have for a while deemed politically incorrect for mm -hmm. us to say and acknowledge. And I work with a lot of couples and they're kind of like the things that I have seen, like these are fundamental truths about what creates arousal and a sense of fulfillment in our relationships that we haven't been allowed to say. And I still think they're true. I mm -hmm. think that while a woman um, wants to feel like you respect me and like you, you actually see me as an equal partner, there's oh still God. something. I know you can open your door. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But there's still something lovely about being treated like a lady and that, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm with this man, I feel safe enough to soften into him and to, you know, put down the role of all the masculine energy that I have to be in the world and in the workplace and in motherhood and all of these things. And when I'm with my man, it mm -hmm. feels really nice to, maybe not be in the lead for a little mm -hmm. bit. And and that's okay. And I think that requires that we feel, again, enough of that like sense of self and integration within me that no part of me is diminished yeah. by allowing myself to, you know, be in that sense of like, yeah, if this feels good to be in a masculine containment. Do I remember right, Danae, in your book, and I, I hope I'm not mixing up your book with another good book, but this is a good thing, <laughs> but it was fascinating. I think you said, you never felt more in your masculine energy than when you became a mother. Yes. Which I just thought was really cool. And you pointed out the irony of that, I think. Do you want to yeah. sort of address that? And I didn't, I never thought about that until I, I really started to like understand and unpack what motherhood is, but it's really mm -hmm. sort of like contain and keep safe and task and delegate responsibility and lead and all of these things that like in a society where we were more collectivist, I think women had the support of other women helping mm -hmm. them sort of usher, you know, this new phase of life and moving from maiden to mother. So they had time to heal and they didn't have to be in this sort of hyper masculine space. But in the nuclear family structure, I find that women are so in their masculine when they have a new mm -hmm. baby and also like really just sort of like what just happened, <laughs> like discombobulated. Um, but what ends up happening is with couples, I find those first two years are so challenging because the man is like what do you want from me as we were just saying but also it's a little bit of a battle of the alphas like you know she's sort of like out alphaing him and he's like listen like this isn't gonna fly for me um and a lot of couples really struggle and I think yeah. it's just naming that like yeah she is really in her masculine right now and that's why it feels that way and how do I find ways to come back into my feminine a little bit and like you know, a little bit of that ability to be creative and maybe get back into my body in a way that I feel more embodied when I've sort of been in this disembodied practice of, or experience of um, becoming a mother, whatever that is. Right. But yeah, I'd never thought about it until I realized like, I am so in like take charge mode mm -hmm. and like, you know, that mama bear energy, they talk about like, there's nothing more fierce in the world than the energy of a mama protecting her cub. But a lot of times that's playing out in our nuclear family structures. With yeah, so husband. it's interesting that with in, in those terms, not surprising then that phenomenon, as you noted, and I was just thinking in, in the sexual domain, that phenomenon, yes, of course, there are physical reasons for a few weeks or however long when you're healing, yes. but that phenomenon that the erotic charge takes a real hit in that's early right. motherhood uh, early parenthood, you know, but when the it's an early motherhood thing, that's not surprising. It's like, well, yeah, if you're looking for that sort of masculine feminine thing to be erotic, that's there right. ain't much of it there when she's all masculine and he is too. Yeah. It's not only, is it not super like the polarity is sort of like off. So we don't feel that natural draw towards one another. And we've sort of made that, you know, because she's healing or whatever. And that's a part of it to your point. But I also think there's a way that it's really hard for a woman to just like snap her mindset back into being in that receptive mode when she is mm. so in the giving and the caring and the making sure everybody else is covered to mm -hmm. all of a sudden be able to be in her body enough to actually authentically experience pleasure. And so it's, she just rather not a lot of times. And I love to just like name that this is what's happening because I feel like both people in the partnership are just feeling like there's something wrong with us that we mm. just can't get there with this, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> oh, it's been a delight to meet the two of you. And I'm going to go read your book now. I, I, I love mean, everything to, you're yeah. saying. I'll, I'll, I'll send you some PDFs. 
no, uh, to, to people viewing and listening to this, you can actually go buy my books. But, <laughs> but, but also, when does your book come out? I know it's still forthcoming, right? Yeah, May 28th. Um, it's going to be available everywhere. And it's all about all of the dynamics that we're talking about and how I see them playing out with couples. I give lots of examples of like how right. I see them playing out and what to do about it. Yeah, And, and say the title again. It's um, Sovereign Love. Thank you, Judy. Um, Sovereign Love, A Guide to Healing Relationships by Reclaiming the Masculine and Feminine Within. And just for folks who are, who knows when they'll be seeing this or, or hearing it, uh, that's 2024 is the year. So yes. it's coming out, what you said, May 28th, 2024. And uh, so people can, and they can find that wherever you can find books, presumably. That's right. You guys are the best. You're like on top of all the things I'm forgetting to say. Oh yeah. Well, you. we started this podcast actually as a way of promoting one of my books when it, which came out on February 29th, 2020, Aww. just in time for the pandemic. You're How cool like, is that? Really? <laughs> so the, there went all the so possibility. Yeah. Was born, so so wow. we, we started the podcast. We kept having fun doing it. So that's why we do it. Yeah. But I bet that gave a lot of people opportunities to hear the podcast and really connect to what the two of you are doing in yeah, that way. Yeah. And we've been having a blast doing it. We've been oh. meeting great folks like you. I mean, you know, this is great. We we've met so many interesting people over the past what are we coming up on four years? Coming now? up on four years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's been great. Wow. Yeah. Just so such thank a delight you. to meet the two of you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for doing it. Well, we hope you enjoyed that interview with Danae as much as we enjoyed interviewing her. Indeed. She was really a lot of fun, mm -hmm. as, as so many of our guests have been. It's just been mm -hmm. it's been really great. We, we've been talking about that. We It's such a privilege. We get to do this. And it's funny. Danae was in, we're in Vermont. Danae was in Los Angeles. Right. The, the interview we did for our previous, the most recent uh, podcast was with somebody in, uh, in Australia, in Australia. Yeah. we've been all over the world. We've had Germany folks in Europe and, and yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we've been England all over the place. And, yeah. I don't yeah. think we've had anybody in Asia yet, but maybe that'll change. Who knows? Yeah, that's true. So we've been or, or Africa. I don't think we've had anybody in Africa yet. Anyway, there's people so all over the place. if you're in Asia and Africa. <laughs> Get in touch <laughs> if you know. want to be on the show. Yeah, <laughs> Love let to us have know. you. <laughs> uh, and uh, buy our books and sign up for my newsletter and drop us a line and all that kind and of good stuff. And follow us and like us and tell your friends. Tell your friends. Absolutely. And so until next time, remember, be kind, don't panic, and have faith.